and welcome to those that are joining us. So this is going to be good. I uh, He doesn't know this, but I have a little clip of when we did Arbor Day tree planting. Just, ah, it's not a video because I didn't want to take that time. It's just a picture, but um, it's really know. good. I know it now. Shoot. Hi, Rich. We're live. Okay, yes, great. we are live and people are starting to join us. Very good. And we will get started momentarily just to be respectful of people's time. Excellent. So, Rich, I know you were out there taking your walk in the freezing cold, right? Always out there. Always out there. Absolutely. I was actually looking at some down, down ashes, oh. thinking about how I'm going to collect them. Okay. And, uh, get them out of the edges of the fields. Ooh, Usual spring chores, fence mending, all those things that you get ready for, and then you get frustrated by the cold. And you keep fighting back against it. And then do you get behind? Do you get ahead? It's always the issue. Yeah. So you fight and fight and do the best you can. Yeah. And uh, as Andy Bennett always says, take it in very small bites. There because it's easy to get overwhelmed uh, with weather events and things like that and plans. So plan judiciously in small bites and you'll make it through whatever you plan for. Very smart. So, so. Words of wisdom. Advice. Okay, so I think we're going to get started. Um, people can join us as they can. Um, so welcome, everybody, to this month's Backyard Forestry in 90 Minutes Online. My name is Lori Jensen. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Forestry Association, and super glad to have you here again. Um, if it's your first time, welcome. If you're one of our regulars, welcome back. Uh, you know the routine. Stop by the chat to say hi to us when you get a chance. If you have questions for our presenter at any time during the presentation, you can go pop them in the Q&A, and we'll go over those at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, we're going to get started. So first of all, mark your calendars now because we actually do this every month. For many years now, we've actually been doing this every month. So save the date. Every third Thursday of the month, we'll be here. Hopefully you will be too. And if you missed them, okay, we'll be sad. But the good news is that we do have them popped up on YouTube. So check out our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe so that you'll get notifications when we put something else up there. And uh, past past presentations are there. So, uh, And this is actually an old thing. I'm going to have to change this because we have more subscribers and certainly more videos up there. So, <laughs> But that's our that's our YouTube channel. So, Rich, I think I'm going to let you take over from here because super excited about what's going on for this. Would you like to to explain? Oh, sure. A well, bit? let's talk. Let's talk. Just go backwards a couple a week to the annual meeting, which we just completed. So, if Lori and I look happy, it's because we got through an annual meeting in the first time ever in my life that running a large meeting where there were no cringe-worthy events and everything went totally smoothly. Everybody was happy. The panelists were great. The attendees were great. The supporting organizations, the collaborating organizations were incredible. And we just had a great time. So everybody was happy. And that's a good thing. So we're coming into this thing. But we did announce our upcoming Walk in the Woods on June 14th. The details are going to be announced, but it, they don't tell anybody. But it involves the Allen Road Project, which is an incredible project by the Forest Service. And it, it also will involve a visit to a, an Atlantic white cedar restoration project. Okay. And what else do we have? You want to take this one too? Throw it. Uh, <laughs> caught. Um, anyway, uh, we we do a lot of things as the association. A lot of folks are regulars on these on these webinars, but some of you are probably new to us. Uh, we are the New Jersey Forestry Association. We're the only association that sort of stands up for the rights of landowners, whether they be public or private. Uh, and we support science-based active forest management on properties. Everything science-based, responsible, sustainable forestry. And we have a lot of things we do. We issue newsletters. We have a website. We have an annual meeting. The New Jersey Woodland Stewards takes place annually. This, historically, it's taken place at Camp Linwood McDonald. It's a three and a half day immersion in forests and forest practices. It's a great time. Everybody leaves there very like with this amazing feeling of camaraderie, like they went to the camp something like on their shirt and uh, they feel like kids again. 
and uh, they learn a lot about forests and trees. Uh, backyard forestry in 90 minutes, here you are. Uh, landowner representation, that's a really interesting one. Now, one of the things we focused on very heavily at the meeting was following legislation that affects forests and making sure that it does so in a responsible way and also uh, supports science-based forest management. Good enough, Lori? Good enough. And, you know, I'm just thinking about, as you said that, that we have, I think there's 86 bills on our, that we're monitoring in Trenton right now, right? right. 86. It's, um, there's a lot going on and we're really good and you're amazing at keeping track of things and making sure that our woodland owners are protected. So thank you for that. Okay. So without further ado, oh, come on. There we go. <laughs> so I, <laughs> isn't it so cute? <laughs> so, um, I like to introduce our presenter for today. And I actually popped that link in the chat. So if you want to see the whole video on what we did last Arbor Day, uh, you can watch the whole thing. But this is just a highlight where he's actually being shown how to plant a tree by that young man. So <laughs> he's telling him exactly where to put the dirt. So uh, Rick, I'm going to stop sharing my slides so you can get going. And again, thank you for being here today. Sure. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Rich. Thank um, you. I've had I've had plenty of people tell me where to put things, just like that young fellow was telling me how to plant that tree. So it's all good. <laughs> it's not the first time. That was Got a lot it. of fun. That, that was a lot of fun for sure. That was a great day. Yep. Yep. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for checking in. Um, I am Richard McCoy, like I like they mentioned, and I just need to get my screen shared up here. Oh, I am sharing. Hold on one second. Let me fix this. Yep. You would think by now. Yeah, right. This would not happen. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. There you yeah, go. Thanks. Perfect. So I'm Richard McCoy. I'm the owner of Richard McCoy Horticultural Services. I've uh, been in the industry for longer than I like typically think about, but it's over 30 years. Um, started in the industry as an arborist um, and mostly in that capacity was spraying and, and, and doing a lot of pruning and removals and things like that. Um, after that, a little, little bit, four years or so, I spent uh, about six years as a landscape contractor, working for a landscape contractor. And I started my company, incorporated my company in 1998. Um, as a conventional landscape company. And in 2005, we, we began to transition to, from conventional to all organic applications, turf management, pest control, um, native plants, green infrastructure. And in 2017, we actually started what we call our sustainable transition initiative, which started our transition from gas to all electric. Um, and I'm gonna to touch on that if I have some time at the end, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because we're talking about tree planting today, but, um, that's been a pretty cool transition to, to see how the industry is moving towards uh, electric and how it's actually feasible to do it and some of the things that we've done um, as far as that's concerned. But like I said, today we're talking about trees. Um, it's been a while since I've actually had a discussion on tree planting. It has mostly been native plants and electric equipment over the past couple of years. So this is a refreshing, a refreshing uh, change of pace here. Um, so the first thing that uh, we're, we want to talk about whenever we talk about landscaping from my my sense of what landscaping is is how you know looking at that property as in a holistic view um again we're doing things organically in my company which means we're, we're looking everything from soil biology to you know the living things in the tree canopy and and all kinds of ecological things and stuff like that so um so tonight we're going to talk about that just briefly in the, at the onset then we're going to talk about site selection tree species and selection, planting processes, and maintenance of planted trees, newly planted trees and existing. Um, so basically organic land care, ecological land care um, from the Rutgers Cooperative Extension uh, Organic Land Care Working Group and the manual that we drafted in 2013. Um, this is the description of what that is and that pretty much puts a, puts a nice little bow on how, how, we, how we manage land. Um, so some of the things that really drive what we're doing here uh, um, in, in coming from a conventional sense, again, we're looking at <clears throat> it's a product based approach, which means you're looking at a, a, a problem and spraying a pesticide or adding additional fertilizers or things like that that bypass the natural systems in in landscaping and in the, in, in the plant world. 
Um, and a lot of times what I'll do when I speak to folks is I'll, like, obviously we can't do it here, but you're welcome to raise your hands. Um, obviously to, to most of us, I think the planet that we live on is a living thing. It's not a static place. Um, and there are lots of systems that we should be dealing with. And, you know, the landscape industry in some aspects has gotten away from those natural systems and towards a product-based approach of doing things. Um, so when we look at a holistic approach to land care, we're looking, like I mentioned, take, taking all those living things into consideration and, and practicing those kind of things that, that build ecology and the systems that we're working with. Uh, whereas, like I mentioned, the conventional uh, type of landscaping will use invasive species, non-natives, doesn't do anything for ecology for us. Um, there's an indiscriminate use, at pervasive use of synthetic chemicals, you know, glyphosate, you know, not so much neonics anymore, but certainly that that was an issue and other things too. other synthetic chemicals have done a great amount of damage to soil um, and it decreased decreased our, our, our native plants connectivity and negatively, obviously negatively have affected our insect populations, which is problematic. Um, so from an organic lands, uh, organic landscape standpoint, we're looking at building natural defenses, like I mentioned, um, increasing native plant populations so we can build those ecosystems um, and try to try to build some connectivity um, like they do with the um, Homegrown National Park. If you haven't heard of Dr. Doug Talmy, I recommend you look him up um, and read his books. Um, he's got three, three or four of them that are that are amazing. That really draws down really well on why we should be using native plants and, 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 the, and the problems that, that come along with not using native plants. So, and these, these are the things that we're trying to recreate when we're designing our landscapes, um, increasing pollinators and beneficial insect diversity <clears throat> and reducing problematic and unnecessary areas of lawn, which is something that we do too. We'll look at these areas that are troubled and in our company, we'll try to remove those lawn areas, incorporate native plant species to number one, obviously build the, the, the diversity of insects and, and plant material. Number two, the, with all the discussions of leaf blowers and you know leave the leaves and what do we do with that? If we can take away any lawn areas to, and make these lawn areas native plant beds where we can incorporate any excess leaves that may fall during the fall season and just leave them there. Don't, don't take them away, just leave all that good ecology. Um, and try to create the natural systems that we're trying that we're talking about. <clears throat> Site selection. Everybody, that's hopefully the ninety some people that are on here have heard this term before, right plant, right place. And hopefully you're using that. And what I'm going to talk about as we go through this is how uh, a website that, that'll help you find um, some plants in particular for sites that you are working with. Uh, and again, native plant for every site condition you know, those those words ring true because there is a native plant for every site condition. In so once you start to drill down on your native plant species and understand that you can put, you know, under tree cover, there there's naturally occurring native plant species that like to live in, you know, heavily wooded areas that you can, you know, incorporate plugs of these plants in, you know, and and work with what the site offers. So if you have a site that is, is shady, you try to deal, if you have healthy trees that are providing that shade, work around those trees. You know, we don't, we don't want to take trees down if we can help it. Obviously, our trees are in a lot, of tr a lot of trouble now. Obviously, with the ash and the beach issues we have coming up and the consistent battering of oaks for, for, from one disease or another. Um, if we have healthy trees, we certainly want to leave them and don't take them down, take them down just for the sake of uh, taking them down, trying to grow grass. Um, you can find native plant species that'll fit any site on, on the property you're working on. Um, observe neighboring landscapes for plant hints. Look around and see what neighbors have. Are they getting, you know, is there deer foraging happening on a native, on, on, a, pro on a neighbor's property? Um, do they have native plant species on their site? Do they have a rain garden? Are they using any kind of um, green infrastructure? So those are the things that if you look at it, you can, if you're doing a design or if you're, you're a homeowner, um, looking at a neighbor's property, you can help to understand where that development may be transitioning to, um, which is kind of kind of interesting these days because you do have folks that, you know, some folks have stopped cutting the grass altogether. Some folks are doing a, a combination of things that we're talking about, reducing lawn areas and incorporating natives. The thing is when you're starting to incorporate natives, if you're doing it on your home garden, is to be intentional. Um, that's an important distinction between, you know, native plant landscaping and, and, and the the very high end formal um, sort of estate or really highly quaffed landscapes, which native plants can be, you know, very neat, but it needs to look intentionally. Nice to have nice clean edges, 
um, and things like that. So those are things. So you have those cues for care. So if somebody sees they're walking by your property, they understand that there might be something else uh, happening here. And signage also helps too for things like that. If you if you are doing native plantings, any kind of signage that you can get um, to let people understand what it is they're looking at, so they don't think they're looking at a weedy mess. Um, as the uneducated, I would look at. So that's sort of the the basic things on, on what we're talking about as far as, again, just incorporating some of the organic practices and, and some of the things that we're doing as far as site selection. Uh, and we want to use plants that will adapt to the site. You will hear terms. So, oops, that slides out, slides out of order. So just that plant placement real quick. You know, 35, 40 years ago, we had trees that were planted within 10 feet of of buildings in, in this re in this instance of residence. And obviously that tree is way overgrown that space. So the goal for us is to understand that a white pine, even though it may be 10 feet, and when you plant it 30 years ago, that it's going to grow and be 60 to 80 feet tall, um, you know, 40 feet wide or more. Um, by the time they get to be this big, obviously, you know, they start to break apart and we have issues with snow and ice. Um, and they they started to me as they get older and have those those storm weathered and characteristics that sort of gives you the charm to me of the uh, old white pine um, to see those sort of gnarled branches and broken off pieces and hollow hollow spaces in 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 those trees when they're not dense and you know they're weathered and they tell the story of all the things they've been through uh, as far as weather goes so at any rate we want to plant them obviously away from buildings not close to buildings because the goal is to let a tree like this grow for 40 60 80 100 years if we can not to cut it down in 30 and have to replant it um, so getting back to to plants that would be adaptable, you you hear landscape contractors or folks that talk about plants all the time about they use terms like tolerate. Um, and if you you drill down and figure out or look at what that the term tolerate means, it's not a very pleasing sort of uh, word to use when you talk about plant material. Nobody likes to tolerate anything, right? You want to be comfortable. You don't want to be you know, tolerating it. Is is you know you're you're uncomfortable to a point, but you're putting up with it doesn't mean you're going to be, you know, happy. You're not going to be happy in the space for, for an extended period of time. And when you look then drill down, look in the dictionary, permit, suffer, and allow. I mean, just the fact that the word suffer there is, is a synonym for tolerate should pretty much tell you all you need to know. Another is withstand, right? Do you want to withstand being under, you know, do you want to withstand laying out on the lawn for four hours when it's a hundred and, 105 degrees? Probably not. Can you? Yes, you can, but it's not ideal. So you have to think of plants in the same way as people, right? They're going to they're gonna want to be comfortable in the spots where you're putting them. Trees, perennials, doesn't matter. So synonyms again, um, to cope, defy, suffer again. So we're not, again, we're not looking at, at, at adaptability. We're looking at things that will, you know, they'll just sort of tolerate it. And maybe, maybe they will withstand and tolerate all these issues that they have or being bombarded with, or maybe not. So when you look at the word adapt, right, that means you're going to easily be comfortable in these spaces. And again, we have to look plants and look at plants the same way. And looking at those synonyms again, accommodate, acclimate, reconcile, harmonize, which is a word you hear all the time when we speak about landscaping and, and nature. You, you hear about har you know harmony and landscaping. So think of, think of plants as you're looking for them as terms of adaptability, not something that's gonna have to suffer through an existence. <clears throat> So a couple, just a quick idea of what we're talking about with this kind of site selection and adaptability um, and, and plant location. This, this is Andromeda or Pieris japonica um, in full shade. It's nice, has a nice evergreen, not a native, um, obviously the, the word japonica. Um, so it's not a native, um, but it is a good pollinator. Lots of bumblebees in the spring, which is important. Um, in shade, it really is a nice, healthy plant, good color, real healthy, good flowering. Um, but then when you put it out to the sun, you end up getting lace, lace, uh, lace wing issues and mites and things like that. So understanding and understanding the plant culture and the culture where that plant is being put is going to be very, very important to your success of your plantings, whether it's a tree. We're using shrubs here as an example, but it's it's basically the same. You have to know the plant, the, the culture of the tree and the location that tree is going into. So the nice thing about this is if you have a, a, a plant that is in a location that it's getting some stress and you can figure out, like for like I mentioned, in the Pierre's japonica is a, tr a plant that likes shade. If you move it into the shade, these issues will go away. 
if you leave it out in full sun and you're constantly spraying and trying to kill that pest, it's still really never going to be healthy. Um, it'll struggle. So we're looking to get plants into spots that it, where they're happy and that adaptability is important. We want to use keystone species. Um, we'll talk about that, right? So keystone species are oaks and cherries and things like that. Mm -hmm. Main thing with this is we want to bring in lots of caterpillars, lots of bird food, as Doug Talmy calls them, um, because then we know we're starting to develop a, a healthy ecosystem. And if you're not using keystone species, at least other native plant species that are high in ecological value. So in plant selection, a lot of things that are overlooked in, in conventional landscaping is, is ecological value. Is the, you know, they're, they're basically used as a, a, a piece of artwork, right? Like most, most plants, when you put them in a landscape, they have very little ecological value. They're just standing like a statue. You know, and when we're trying to build ecology, um, you know, you want to use a plant like this, and this is Sylvatica, that obviously will give you lots of, you know, great shade in the summer. It'll give you, you know, some Lepidoptera species and obviously some great fall color. Um, and again, this is in a nice wide open space where it was let just to probably, probably not planted here. It was probably just a natural seedling. Um, that, had, that had grown over probably 75, you know, if we know this is Sylvatica, they're pretty slow growing. So this is probably 75, 100 years old, more than likely. Um, so, you know, we're not looking at using things merely on ornamental value. We have to take a look at ecology and understand that that's what we're trying to build in our landscapes is ecology. <clears throat> um, so large ash trees, um, you know, we have, we're, uh, you know, the difficulty we have with the ash trees, this, this tree was unfortunately taken down. Um, there were discussions about treating it, um, but the we decided not to um, after lots of discussion, believe me. It's a 35 inch in diameter um, ash tree right there. So I definitely didn't want to take it down, but it ended up that we decided to have it come down. Um, so what we're looking for when we are um, looking at ecological value, does it attract pollinators, other beneficial insects? Um, I know I think with all the ash trees that are coming down, I think there is a total of 400 different species of insects, whether it's caterpillars, true bugs, and whatnot, that are going to be affected by these trees leaving our ecosystems. So when something like this happens, you know, it very easily could be uh, an extinction event that nobody would ever see because you, know, you don't really, if we haven't really drilled down to understand what insects are really relying on these ash trees we don't know what's going to happen uh in the long term as far as that cascade downward if there is anything um in that trophic level that 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 has to that's relying on the ash tree and then something up the trophic level that has been feeding on whatever that was that was in the ash tree um so contributing to soil structure one of the things we deal with in all all the time in organic land care um, and, and organic land care is soil and, and biology, soil biology and, and, and soil chemistry and things like that. So obviously we want to alleviate compaction as much as possible. So when we talk about these tree plantings and, and incorporating native plantings underneath them, we know that we're going to eliminate soil compaction because we're not constantly going over these areas with lawnmowers, you know, four, four times a month or less or more, depending upon your, your maintenance strategy. So Sequestration of carbon is obviously very important these days that we have a large focus on. So when we're taking all these trees down, again, like we're looking at that pine tree on the corner of a house, it's unnecessary to take that down um, or not unnecessary. It was necessary to take it down. So, you know, how much carbon are we, we, we putting back into the atmosphere when we're doing removals like that that are unnecessary if we have taken a look at what that tree or tree was at maturity before it was planted. Um, and again, obviously it's something I like to talk about the ecology. So what's the ecological value and support and does it benefit the ecosystem services? Um, at NWF, the National Wildlife Federation.org, this is the uh, work that uh, Dr. Doug Talmy has done. Um, and you'll see here, these are the, the, the key uh, small sample size of uh, Lepidoptera species that are that are driven to some of these um, key, keystone species trees, oaks, black cherry, willow, birch, poplar, obviously the top five. And you can see butterfly and moss species, 534 by oaks, uh, down to 368, excuse me, <clears throat> by poplar. And you can do this with perennials as well. 
So on the perennial side, the highest driving plant is Solidago or Goldenrod. And I believe that attracts somewhere in the area of 100, 120, 125, 130 species of caterpillars. Um, and again, you hear me talk about this a lot because it is important, and I'll explain to you why that is in just a moment. So if you can go to the nationalwildlifefederation.org, nwf.org, <clears throat> put in your zip code, and that they, they can drill down on right to your zip code um, what plant species would be benef most beneficial for your location. Um, also, Jersey Friendly Yards has a very good website as far as that goes also. Um, and that's uh, Jersey Friendly Yards, I think. Dot org, but you can just Google, obviously, do a search for Jersey Friendly, Jersey Friendly Yards, and you'll find that there. So this is why we're doing what we do with the planting, planting our trees. Is we're, we're driving, driving those beneficials to to that landscape. <laughs> Excuse me. So again, this is what it looks like when you go to the website. Um, it'll show you the oaks. You can click on these. Things are all active links. Um, if you click on where it says. Uh, save you you can start your own um your own catalog uh, per se of of trees and shrubs that you would like to plant or at least just keep an eye on and again the 513 um notated by the butterfly there is how many lepidopter lepidopter species are drawn into those trees um yeah it's pretty cool and then when you click on when you click on that number What'll happen is, or the butterfly, what'll happen is it'll populate all the all the butterflies, Lepidoptera, all those caterpillar species that are drawn to these to these plants. And then the cool thing is then you can actually, if you see them on your on your trees, you can um you can identify them, which is which is really pretty cool. So the real reason we're doing this is because of the chickadee scenario. Maybe some of you have heard of this, the work of Doug Talmy and his grad student. Um I'm going to blank on her name now, Desiree, Desiree Narango, um, did some really great work, which was, which was really key to, to me and my company and how we transitioned from an understanding why it was important to get away from using non-native plant species and using native plants in our landscapes um, to drive this ecology that's so important. <clears throat> so black-capped chickadee, um, pretty small little bird. Um, but I think it's about two ounces or less. Um, in 16 to 18 weeks, they they catch anywhere from six to 9,000 caterpillars to bring back to their nest for their little chicks to grow up and fledge. If you think of that in terms of one oak tree bringing in 500 plus species of caterpillars and 95% of our terrestrial birds all feeding their young caterpillars all roughly at the same time, including woodpeckers, um, we need a lot of bird food. And that's why we're talking about planting these keystone species and why that's so important. Um, an interesting fact too, that, they, that with the chickadees is they only travel 50 meters from the nest. So, you know, that by having chickadees on your property, you know, you know that you have, you have the beginning at least to a healthy, a healthy beginning of an ecosystem. This is realistically the canary and the black capped chickadee in the coal mine, right? Because if you can't, if you can't have chickadees on your, if you can't support chickadees on your property, then you know you have an ecosystem that's out of balance. This is just sort of the start of it. Um, but if you see chickadees on your property, then something's working somewhere relatively close to your property to have them, have them be healthy there. That doesn't belong there. The process of planting. Okay, so, um, this this a lot of folks when we talk about planting um and contractors and homeowners alike um there's there are steps that are missed that really are detrimental to the to the overall plant health longevity um short term long term so planting depth is really important so when we're when we're when we're planting tr trees and shrubs the important thing to do is to find that root color so we're looking to get any soil off the top of the root color <clears throat> and exposing that root flare so that the, the, the root flare being exposed means that it, it stays dry. And what happens when that root flare is, is covered by mulch and soil, you'll get girdling roots and uh, you'll get rotting issues because anything below that flare, anything below the flare that you see here, 
um, that just meets the soil profile. In this picture, we probably could have gone a little bit lower um, when we did our, our cursory root color excavation. Um, but you see anything below that flare is fine to stay wet. That's the roots, that's the root system. So they, you know, they want some moisture, other plant, you know, depending upon the plant species, um, that level of moisture will vary. Um, but typically the roots are made to stay wet. Anything above that root flare wants to stay dry. And even though trees are solid, um, they're still porous and there's atmospheric gases that need to pass in and out um, to keep that tree healthy. Cambium layer is just below the barks, the bark there, which means if that starts to rot away, you're going to have issues with nutrient uptake because the cambium layer is going to start to be um, compromised. And we'll continue on with this discussion about, you know, proper planting and planting depth as we move along. Um, transplanting can be as easy as, you know, having a site on a property, knowing that if you're, if you're taking a tree out of a, a digging a tree and putting it right into another hole, typically we'll be, we'll, we'll wrap some burlap around it. But when we move this, it was the, 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 um, the root ball was very solid. It was heavy clay. Um, it was going right into the hole that you see that we're, we're heading towards at this point. So, you know, a lot of different ways to move, move trees um, on a landscape. So that was one. And I think this was probably a early spring or late fall planting. Um, we moved three sources away from the corner of the house. Um, you're going to notice that there's no mulch, right? Right up against the trunks. There's uh, some bare soil actually. Um, and there's wells to hold moisture just created out of mulch. Now, just so you know, this wasn't a finished project. Um, this was just the onset of the project. So there was a lot of other work that went into this and the pack of sand was gone. There's all native species in there. This was just the onset of, of starting to, to move things around the property. This is not a finished job of ours by any means. <clears throat> all right, so when we're looking at containers, um, we like to we like to be a little rough with these guys. Um, so we'll take them out of the pots. And a lot of times you'll see they'll be pot bound. Um, this one, this azalea is not terrible, um, but we do want to make sure that we scarify the root systems to some extent. You, you know, later in the season or early in the season, if you've gotten a plant from a nursery and it's it, it's difficult to get out of the pot, it could be pot bound from the previous season. Or again, if it's later in the season, it's been growing there all year. So the roots are all bound up in there. So we even, we'll just take a spade and put a slice right down the container, the side of the container. And that's how we'll get the plant out of the pot. And then you'll see the the, the vertical marks on the root ball there. Um, we'll, we'll start to break that root ball up and loosen those roots up and, and before we put it in the ground. That's sort of getting there. We got a little more to go. We've really sort of taken 50% of that existing, initial existing root ball off, off of that azalea, um, put it in a nice big hole and uh, put it in the ground and that's finished. <clears throat> so when we're talking about planting B and B, bold and burlap trees, um, what we want to do in these cases is as much as, as much as practical, take the cage and burlap off of the trees. Reason is for me, everybody has, the, there's differing opinions on why we do this, but for me, the issue is, is, is this. Uh, number one, we want to do that cursory root collar excavation. Like I mentioned, we want to get all that soil off the top of the root ball um, and, and make sure that we have our soil height. Number two is the cages I prefer to take off um, because I don't want to worry about any girdling down the road. Again, differing, op differing opinions on whether or not that is an issue. Um, I have seen I have seen roots growing, uh, the, the, the cages growing through roots before. Whether that had any adverse effects on trees, I'm not sure. But to me, it's better safe than sorry. And if it takes a couple of minutes to take the cages off, take the burlap off, then um, we're going to do that. And that's typically the way we the way we plant our trees. <clears throat> we'll go into a little more detail before before we, uh, as I move along here. So that's basically what we're looking at when we put a tree in, just before we're ready to put a tree in the ground. And you know, a couple different ways of doing this is you could either do it if it's a single tree by the hole. Um, any kind of work you're going to do with the root ball, you want to minimize the moving as much as possible um, because what will happen is the more you move it without it tied up, the root ball will loosen up, you'll have a chance of compromising the tree um, and then it'll die. If, if, if a tree root ball should break up substantially, put it in the hole and then treat it as a bare root plant. Um, make sure that you water it well initially and that you... Um, 
move the move the trunk around and, and eliminate any air bubbles so those air pockets fill in with with uh, soil and organic matter and things of that nature so that's what you want to do if it if it should fall apart and then stake it when we can talk about staking later uh soil amendments <clears throat> to amend or not to amend that's a, another thing that folks have varying opinions on um i've come to the conclusion for us anyway we do very little in the way of soil amending very little at all uh, again, because going back to the onset of the presentation, we were talking about making sure that plants are fit, uh, selected to uh, for for location on a property. So, you know, we're doing soil testing to understand uh, what the chemical what the chemical makeup of these locations are, um, and we're we're selecting plants to go in those plants perennials trees to go in those locations based on uh, our findings of soil testing. Um, and things of that nature. But if you were to amend, use things like amumates, compost, compost teas, um, mycorrhizae. An interesting thing, the discussion that we've had about mycorrhizae is, you know, we talk about invasive species. And the one thing that we don't really understand to this point, and maybe uh, it's been a while since I've used mycorrhizal inoculants um, for this reason, like we don't know exactly where those mycorrhizae are coming from. Um, we don't know if there's natural mycorrhizae in the soil, that if we put invasive species mycorrhizae fungi in the soil, if that's going to be counterproductive to the natural uh, fungi that are there. So we've gotten away from that. Um, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. Again, I, I'm, I'm just erring on the side of caution, um, understanding that when you know we look at plant culture, right plant, right place, those strategies that I really haven't found a need to add mycorrhizal fungi to the plants at, you know, for that reason. Now, with that said, if, if, if it's an existing plant that's struggling, I think that's when you can make a argument for doing any soil amending. Um, you know, then if it's a tree or a shrub, if you're going to use an air spade and you're going to do some, some root collar work and you're going to turn the soil over and you want to put some compost um, typically compost is really all you need. Um, but you know, again, you could, you could make an argument for mycorrhizae if you wanted to, um, and axis, we used to use a product called axis, uh, which is again, large aggregate, uh, diatomaceous earth, which is pictured here. Um, and the, the, the great thing about that is, and I think it's similar to biochar now, um, is that it has these little, little, little spaces, air pockets for the, for the beneficial fungi and bacteria to sort of hang out, right? Because every living thing needs food, water, and shelter. So these, these diatoms um, leave spaces, poor spaces for the, for those little, little critters to, to hang out in. They're like uh, biological condominiums, right? Pretty cool. But I think that's pretty, very similar to like what biochar does nowadays. This is an older product. <clears throat> Okay, so this is a thing, uh, DPS, DPSC syndrome. This is kind of tongue in cheek, um, but serious at the same, the same, on the same line. So there, there are a lot of issues with planting that happens in the landscape industry, whether it's industry or homeowners, just the nursery industry, planting in general. So I figured, why not come up with a a a title for the issues that we have. So I've decided that I've come up with a title for it and I've called it the disconnected plant supply chain syndrome. Now, what is that, right? Well, there's a lot of things that go wrong from nursery into the landscape. So as we go forward here, I'd like to sort of think that maybe all the things that go wrong in the landscape with tree planting, if we could put a name to it and identify it, perhaps, we can understand how and why we need to fix it. So again, it's tongue in cheek. Um, I just sort of came up with this as an idea to put a to put a to put a name to some of the things that go wrong when we're planting trees. So um, who knows? Maybe if you start using it, we'll get some legs. So this is why it's disconnected, and I didn't just call it nursery supply chain syndrome because I'm not blaming one one era area of our industry. It's the whole big picture, right? Um, there's there's enough finger pointing to go around. So um, one of the problems we have is initially in the, in the, in the, in the nursery setting is plants are, tr are, are planted too deeply. Then uh, 
you know, soil is built up upon those root balls. Then prior to digging, they just they just go in with tree spades and leave all the soil on top of the root ball, which means that at this point it goes to whether it's a landscape contractor or homeowner um, or retail, wholesale, re-wholesale, whatever the case is. Then somebody takes this plant and puts it in the ground like the trees that are being be behind the one in the foreground. Lots of problems with that. Okay, so we're going to talk about that as we move along here. So again, it's not a nursery issue. Starts at the nursery, but it's not a nursery issue. It's how we handle it moving forward. Um, so this is what I sort of looked at for DPSC syndrome. I call, <laughs> so the vectors would be nursery, landscape, industry, non-industry installations, pretty much everybody. Symptoms, weak, struggling, newly planted, existing trees, the timeline, six months to 35 years. Outcomes, girdling roots, superfluous surface roots that leave trees vulnerable to drought and cold. Also, Anchoring, right? We have anchoring issues when when those when the main root system is dying, um, and we just have those superfluous roots that are growing up in the soil and, and mulch volcanoes. Um, so you get slow dieback of the canopy, and you have a very high rate of mortality and elevated cost of replacements because now once trees die, we have to mobilize, and somebody's losing money somewhere. <clears throat> so what does this look like when we have a tree that's struggling or a tree that's been in the landscape in the nursery in the landscape for some time? This is Japanese maple. That was probably in the landscape for, I don't know, maybe 15 years or so. And the canopy was thin, which is a telltale, like I said in the, in the previous slide, is a telltale that you have issues with, with the main root system. Um, the, you first see the canopy, small leaves, curled up leaves on top, thinning, um, usually main leader or, or one of the side shoots off of the main leader will start to die back a little bit. And you know, you start to see that die back from the, from the top down. And this is what happens, right? So we've got a Japanese maple been in the landscape for about 15 years and it's been mulched too deeply, probably planted too deeply um, originally. And you can see in the slide here in the after, after when we've done, once we've done a root collar excavation is that uh, you have the flare. <clears throat> there's obviously some rot that you see there. And then there's two sets of roots. Let me see if I can. Yeah, good. There's my cursor. Um, then we have two sets of roots above the flare. And this is what happens when these trees are, again, too deep in the nursery or in the landscape. You begin to get these secondary roots that grow above the main root system. Okay, when that happens, that's when you start to see decline in the canopy. Because what's happening is the main root system is dying back. And as much as we try to kill our poor little trees, they fight and struggle and try to stay alive. And that's when they push out these secondary roots above the root flare. These are not enough to anchor the tree down. They're not enough to support the tree for the longevity of what a tree's life should be. Um, so typically that's what happens. And that's, we see that a lot when we do our air spade work. Um, and a lot of times when you see a situation like this, as we're doing our root collar excavation, you'll see a girdling root one, two, three, or I'll call them a girdling root complex. When you have multiple girdling roots that wrap around the trunk of a tree. Um, a lot of these things can be taken off um, if you do it carefully. Not going to get into that. That's a discussion for another day. But um, so you see what goes on here. All right. So the original soil depth, secondary roots develop as the, as the main root system dies, major root rot damage, the system below the root collar. And that should have been our proper planting depth somewhere in that range. <clears throat> okay. Disconnected plant supply chain syndrome. Again, when you have folks planting trees that have no business planting trees, this is what's this is what happens. So. In the original slide that I showed you in, in this section, when I was talking about the, the root balls of the trees being planted too deep, that was actually that was actually a consultation job I did in a, uh, a mall complex up in Bergen County. And the, just the end game for this was somebody lost $50,000 because all these trees died and they had to be replaced. So somewhere along the line, whether it was the contractor or whoever, whoever bid the job or however this worked out, somebody lost $50,000 on these trees because they had to be replanted. But we found in our, in our site visit, we found everything from, you know, strapping underneath mulch trees that were staked in properly. This is actually irrigation, you know, irrigation line underneath the, the secondary roots of this was a, uh, a sycamore or a London plane. Um, so there's lots of things that go wrong. So this is why I'm calling it what I'm calling it. Um, 
so I apologize for the picture. It was a bunch of years ago when we did this. So this tree is about eight inches, nine inches, potentially 10 inches too deep. Again, had to be replaced. <clears throat> In that same location, um, this is what I was talking about, improperly staked. These stakes really aren't going to do anything to, to support a tree. It's too tight. The banding's too tight here. Um, I mean, we don't even stake our trees. Again, this is another topic for debate. <clears throat> we never stake our trees. Um, the only time we may is if we're in open field area and the tree has a big canopy, maybe the root ball is undersized because the way it was dug in the nursery um, and it doesn't have a lot of support. Very, very rarely, I would say 90%, 95% of the time we don't stake our trees and, and they don't fall over. Um, to me, from a, from a landscape contractor's perspective, <clears throat> this is a loss of profit because it's an unnecessary, unnecessary time and materials um, on a project. You can see at the base of this tree, a girdling root is starting. If that tree had left it in the ground um, or not root collared, uh, that girdling root would eventually more than likely choke that tree. And you can see this tree here is just, we haven't got just getting to the root flare here. And we're, you know, what's that six, seven inches deep um, in that, in that hole there. So here's a row of red maples. <clears throat> You know, this could be anywhere in USA, but obviously we're in Jersey, so it's somewhere in Jersey. Um, so here's a, a maple that was planted same time as some the rest of the trees in the row. I'm going to show you one in particular along the way. Um, but this tree is, is doing fine for now. Um, one thing that you'll notice is, you know, it's missing some pruning. We could, whoever put this in probably could have done a little bit of pruning, structural pruning along the way. Um, here we have a, a, a main leader issue. Um, so it probably could have taken one of these out to support a uh, a main leader instead of having the co-dominant leaders there. Um, but what happens in these situations, trees plant to do deeply. <clears throat> uh, these, uh, this is four inch um, ADS pipe uh, that was put around these trees to prevent buck rub. The trees were rubbed once already and they put that around it to, um, to obviously help keep the, 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 the deer, the buck rub down. Um, so, yeah, so that's been left on there, and all that's getting fairly tight around that. So that really should be taken off. If you're putting, if you're putting things like this on to deter buck rub in the fall, as a maintenance practice, you can take it off in December, because the the buck they're done doing doing their doing their fall antler thing. So um, you know that can come off and just be put on. Typically for us, if we if we're going to do that, we put it back on around August fifteenth somewhere in that range um, and then take it off again, like I said, sometime in the middle of December, or if not in December, obviously, you know, in the early spring. So that, so that we're not worrying about issues of, you know, dampness and things like that up, up around the trunk there. Um, so what happens in a situation like this is in a commercial setting or homeowner, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> the typically the contractor will guarantee the tree for guarantee the trees for a year they don't guarantee what's going to happen to the tree in a year. It may die within six months, like I mentioned in the earlier slide, or they may just start cutting back leaders. Um, the tree is alive, technically, right? It's not doing well, but it's alive. Um, they took out the main leader here, lots of other dead branches underneath. Um, you know, so by the time this tree dies, it's, they're going to have to, somebody's going to have to pay to replant it. Okay, so whereas if we take a couple minutes, typically to root collar these trees the way we do it, to put the put take the cages off and, and the burlap, like like I mentioned, um, it's typically ten minutes per tree. It's not a long time, and in the scope of having to having to replace a tree, which means if it's you know th these trees are three years old, four years old, so obviously the the um, guarantee is long gone. So if this tree should happen to expire this year, the folks that own the property are going to have to pay for it. Whereas if, you know, if the, if these trees, let's just say these trees cost $400 to plant, if it costs us a thousand dollars to plant them and they've been in for four years, we don't have to mobilize to go back and replant them. They're twice the size and they're healthy. It's a no brainer, but at being able to, being able to get that, 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 that point across to folks to understand that, it, you know, cheap is expensive because it's going to have to be replanted and somebody's got to pay for it, like I mentioned. Uh, so a little bit closer, there's a, you see a, a sucker 
um, a water sucker that's shot up from underneath, um, you know, somewhere within that. I didn't take that, obviously, didn't take that off of there. Um, and you can see more pruning has been done in here. So, you know, the tree does not have a very good life ahead of it if it, if it lasts more than another year or so. <clears throat> so we got lots of issues again. Um, there's actually a cage in here. This tree ended up coming out of the ground because as we were as we were doing um, the root collar excavation, air spading in here, as we got down deeper, there was no root system to hold the tree in the ground. Um, so it ended up just coming out. But there's a, you know, there's a cage here. Again, can be left on or not. There's a, plenty of debate for that. Um, but you see, you know, it, it's, we haven't even gotten to the root flare. And you can see where the, there's it's not a sh there's a little bit of a shadow here or it could be a little damp. I mean, this tree could be a good 12 inches deep. Um, and again, it's it comes from the nursery, but it's up to the folks that are doing the planting to understand that we need to take those steps to make sure that these trees are planted at the right depth. Um, this is a tree, uh, dogwood, I believe it was, uh, Cornus, Florida, that we used our air spade on. Um, we did some nice work getting a lot of superfluous roots and curling roots around from um, the, the base of this. Uh, our flare is here, right? We got a secondary root that came out above the flare right here. We left it because it is substantial um, and it's not, it is, the roots are sort of going out into the soil profile and digging down. Um, they're not not just sort of in a pile of mulch where, where they're not going to support the tree. Um, so we left it for that purpose. So our flare is somewhere in here. Probably could have gone a little deeper looking at it a little closer. Um, but you can see where the way these roots are growing that you know there there was you can, and there's mulch back here but so you can kind of see where the the soil profile and mulch led this led these roots to grow up into the path of least resistance which is the mulch and, and loose soil which is why the trees grow up in to those mulch volcanoes because there, there's no nutrients there or very little um but it's it's where they're going to get uh, the path of least resistance not going to most of our soils here are very heavy clay um so we don't have um you know, so they're going to take the path of least resistance, like I mentioned. Um, so if we have a tree in a landscape that we're root collaring, this is basically just by hand, um, big girdling root. And we can cut them out, which we did in this one. Um, and then we mulch them and then we're done. <clears throat> so I think we're getting the picture here. Stop over mulching your trees and shrubs. Don't think I have to say that again. This is what a, a, a mulch ring, if you're going to have a mulch ring, what it should look like. Um, nice and wide, wider the better, less compaction around the root zone, the better off you're going to be. Um, that's what we're looking for. A little wider still underneath, underneath a nice oak. <laughs> so we have a nightmare like this on a property. What do we do? So for maintenance issues, I mean, if you're doing lawn maintenance, why we have a little strip here is beyond me. Um, you know, we have large piles of mulch here. This was actually that Japanese maple that we just root collared in the previous picture. Um, so in a situation like this, what we want to do is we want to incorporate as much of these, these trees in bed areas as possible. So you take away, strip away all the, all the, the unnecessary grass and whatnot here. Um, do your root collar excavations. You can see here where there's a pretty big curly root where there's a depression. Like we're right in here. Where there's some scarring. There's a, a fairly large girling root that wrapped around here that we we're able to take out. <clears throat> Dogwood is in not great shape. Um, so we'll see what that looks like over time. Mulched, over mulched dogwood, air spaded, nice and clean root system here. Um, so you can see where it was, this line here is pretty much where it was, um, the mulch was buried up to. In situations like this is what we'll do is we'll put our air spade, uh, incorporate, do a soil test, incorporate some compost if needed. <clears throat> and then we'll um, obviously get our root flares cleared out and then we'll underplant whole areas with, with native plant species. Um, again, native plant species in all these wide open areas that help to collect leaves in the fall, reduce soil compaction, um, plant, everything just it ends up being much more healthy in the long run. <clears throat> Whoa, really? Well, that was shocking. <laughs> Oh, not to worry. Was, there are lots thought, of questions. I thought I still had more to go. But anyway, um, that's that. See, Lori, I told you I was, I kind of put it together at like 
you know, what was it? Seven, six fifty five when I said, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's perfect. It's perfect. So, uh, so yeah, great. Me, and thank you for the contact information. Yeah. Um, sure. So let me right. just, the, let me just real quick. Um, what I was going to hopefully try to do at the end of this, but I didn't get the time, unfortunately, to put some slides in. Let me just touch real quick on on the electrification of our industry and where we're at, and then we'll then we'll dive into these questions. Um, so, like I mentioned, with our company um, and, and what we did in 2017, we started to transition away from gas to all electric equipment. Now, most folks on this call probably know about the backpack blower bands um, that are happening in the state of New Jersey. Uh, so what we're doing with with Lori and the NJNLA and uh, the American Green Zone Alliance is we're trying to educate um, the industry, in institutions, homeowners, municipalities on what that transition might look like. A lot of folks would just like to ban it at the flick of a switch. And, and what we're trying to advocate for and what we know is the best solution for this is a slow transition away from gas. Um, because like I mentioned with my company in 2017, we started that transition. And it's it is it's got to be a transition because it's it's very expensive if we're going to do it all at once, um, which is what not which is not what most people are calling for. With that said, um, the goal is going to be to eliminate gas completely. So we need to know as an industry and also folks that are, have anything to do with 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 equipment like this is to understand that the target is to get rid of it all. So within the industry, again, what we're advocating for is 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 a slow transition. Seasonal allowances for gas. So what I found out in my work as a as a quote unquote conventional landscaper to one who's transitioning away from conventional is I know that we can run a landscape business successfully on battery equipment during the growing season, you know, from March, from May through the middle of October. There, to, for us, there's no need for any any gas during that time of year. So what we're advocating for is a seasonal uh, allowance for these transitions to happen in the spring and fall, sometime in March, um, you know, October, November into December, when the leaf cover is heavy, you need the extra power for electric, uh, sorry, for gas to get through these seasons where where we can't quite uh, get there yet with with gas. And believe me, there's nothing more than I can't stand at this point. Now that I've used electric for so long, I, there's nothing more than I, I just cannot stand using gas at all. If I didn't have to use it at all, I wouldn't use it. Um, with that said, that's why I know it's important that we have those seasonal allowances. Um, so again, with NJNLA and AGSA is we're advocating for the seasonal allowances, education. Um, NJNLA, AGSA, and NALP are, are teaming up to do online courses uh, for transition so folks can understand online um, how, to, how to, to begin this transition. So we have online courses in English and Spanish. Um, and the other thing is funding. There's been a lot of funding that's been allocated to the EV and, and solar uh, areas. So if, if municipalities and or legislators are, are looking to have this, um, these bans going in, into place, then there should be some allocation of funding for the landscape industry to transition to help, uh, help companies um, support that transition to help them get new equipment and also to um, help that funding as far as education goes um, to help build some good strategies for, for folks to understand how we can make that transition. So it's an ongoing thing. Obviously, Lori's a great person to reach out to. You have my contact information here. Anything we've talked about today um, and the battery powered equipment scenarios, um, you know, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, we're more than happy to, uh, to coach you guys and, and give you some information on that. So um, that's my brief little, little diatribe on, on battery powered equipment. And I'm actually glad you brought that up too, because we do often have a lot of um, uh, people attend backyard forestry that are on environmental commissions, uh, green teams, that kind of stuff that might be helping to make decisions in town. So use Rick as a resource or myself as a resource if you have any issues or questions about that. So yeah, you know, and and, and to that point, it's it's important that we are involved in the conversation. If there's anybody in here from a municipality or or that that any decision makers. Um, because what we're finding is happening, and I have firsthand experience with this, is that there are groups that are that want that are very active that want to ban this immediately. Um, outwardly, they say they want to speak to the industry, but when when we have discussions together, they're they're not so open to the idea of us working together. Um, and it's unfortunate. There are some groups that that we are working with that are open to the idea, but I've actually been shut out of Facebook. 
um, <laughs> Facebook groups and online meetings. Um, the Zoom meeting from one group in particular, I was going to get on and, and the host wouldn't let me in. Um, you know, and, and, and we align on a lot of things, but because we advocate for a slow transition and we're not a knee-jerk immediate removal, um, they don't want to hear from us. So um, it's real important that if we are going to find a solution to this, that we find it together and, and that it is cooperative, cooperative effort. Yeah. So thanks for that, Lori. Yep. Yep. Partnerships and collaboration are always good. And we know that from NJFA as well. Right, Rich? Yeah. Lori, speaking of environmental commissions and various commissions, uh, there is by May 1st, a requirement for virtually every municipality to adopt a tree planting and a tree removal and replacement ordinance. Mm. And this is as part of, oddly enough, it doesn't sound like it, but it's part of their stormwater, TRA stormwater permit. And virtually every municipality has one. And consequently, there's a big rush to adopt these in this last couple of months. So a lot of people are asking questions about how you plant trees. So this is perfectly timed to really respond to this because there are, the model ordinance that was released by the NJDEP requires the trees to be, I believe the homeowner guarantees something to the effect of the homeowner guarantees the tree for 12 months, but the tree has to be checked in 24 months. And there's, there's all kinds of these Machiavellian things that have to be managed. And so how you plant, where you plant, like you were pointing out, selecting the right tree for the right soil. Some towns are adopting their own approved lists of trees, and that may or may not be a one size fit, fits all situation. Where do you plant? Are you overcrowding your trees that are remaining? Because obviously if you're removing trees, you're probably removing them other than hazard to make more space. And so you're going to be pushed further into your already used space and you're gonna end up with overcrowding. So mm -hmm. the whole planning process really says if you're going to replant in a in a an earnest way you speak to someone like rick who can tell you this is a good tree for this area this is this this tree will survive this tree won't survive now with that in mind we had a question about 400 saplings right laurie wasn't that one of the comments yep, yep yeah we and, have a lot of questions yeah <laughs> and uh with plastic tubes the deer came knocked them down started nibbling killed 75 percent well that's a story you hear every day. Um, one of the things you can do just, and I'll start it off, is you can start with larger trees mm. that are higher up and not, not as susceptible to damage and browse. I mean, that's just the first obvious physical step. Uh, do you have any suggestions, Rick, for protecting trees? Um, I mean, if you're going to use the tree tubes like that, you just need to make sure they're well supported so that, you know, th th I guess a lot of times I see the tree tubes when they go in, there's maybe just a bamboo stake that's, mm -hmm. that's holding them up. Um, you know, and that's clearly not going to be enough support. So I would say that's the most important thing is, is in that case in, in particular, um, is to make sure that the, the tree tubes have enough support. Well, and um, if you're doing a significant project, you may actually want to consider fencing. Or that. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is another maintenance issue in itself and a high cost. I understand mm -hmm. that, but it is, yeah, yeah. it is, truly the highest percentage chance of protecting a young tree. Yep. Yep. Um, Lori, do you have any that you, that are, you're spotting that you'd like to highlight? Do you, want, do you want me to stop sharing so that um, if you want to put folks up on the screen, if, if anybody. No, it's, to... it's okay. We're good. Yeah. Okay. No, this is, yeah, this is good. We, um, okay. yeah, we usually will just answer. We'll read the questions and then we'll kind of talk about it. Um, every now and then we might uh, need some clarification, which people can give us, um, you know, through chat or whatever. So we have questions in both the chat and the Q and A. So I'm going to kind of uh, go through both. Um, so uh, Susan had a question. Actually, we saw Susan at the annual meeting on Saturday. Um, yes. it, and uh, so she wants to know when trees are volcano mulched, mulched and there are secondary and girdling roots, are those trees more susceptible to wind throw? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Because of that root system, that's just not yeah, the superfluous root system that's yep. grown up into the mulch. Yeah. Yep. Because the truth, like I like I mentioned, the trees aren't really going to be anchored in the, in the good mineral soil. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to be in, up in the loose mulch. I mean, you see that all the time um, when we have heavy rains, I mean, maybe this weekend, right. We're supposed to get mm -hmm. a pretty bad storm and a lot of rain this weekend. Yep. Um, and, and a good example of that is when you see um, like uh, I see a lot of times in developments, like, uh, uh, pine trees like spruces and pines and things like that will just sort of tip over 
and the you'll see a cluster of grass and then a flat root just the, the root system's all flat yeah right yep. the reason for that is the tree was planted in compacted soil and the roots just you know just went along along the surface and up into the mulch and the tree just came over because there's nothing anchoring it. so that's typically if you see that you know keep an eye out for that after this weekend and, and you possibly could see that yeah yeah, that happened a lot with Sandy. A lot of the trees in our area, right, were that toppled over were that flat. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, no good re root system. So, um, very specific question, but um, uh, Jerry Lynn wanted to know she has a two year old Dawn uh, Redwood seedling in a six inch pot. What size pot yeah. should she transfer it to, and how long can she keep it in a pot? <laughs> um, that's a good question. My question, my first, my question to you would be: Do you need to keep it in a pot? Are you keeping it in a pot because it's too small? I mean, you're talking about a tree, obviously, that's going to be 120 feet tall at maturity in how many years? So, um, six inches. I, I, you know, I would size it up to a three or five gallon and give it some room to give it some room to breathe if you're going to leave it in a container. And so, the best advice was would be to get it planted in the ground as quickly as, yes. as you can. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just just re reaffirming something Rick said. There's another comment here about plant designing landscapes to mature height of trees, which mm -hmm. is something people just don't think about, mm -hmm. and they just say, "Oh, I love that kind of tree," and there it is. And it's like you said, Rick. Thirty years later, it's against the house, and it has to be cut down for safety reasons or fire hazard reasons or whatever it might be. And um, so that designing by mature height is critical. Mm -hmm. Thanks. There was a question asked, how did you get rid of the pack of Sandra in that situation? Uh, it's a trade secret. Okay. It's okay. You have <laughs> no, no, to no, be no. hired. You have to be hired. No, to no. Talk. <laughs> no, no, no. It's fine. Um, so pack of Sandra, Vinca, <clears throat> any of those invasive non-native ground covers that we're going to remove. Uh, first thing we do is we go in with a, a quote unquote beater mower and mow the tops all the way down. And then we, so that you're down to almost bare soil. And then we use a sod cutter to, to cut the, the roots out. Um, and then what happens, it doesn't come up like sod, but what happens is it, you, you can almost use a fork, like a pitchfork and sort of roll it over and cut pieces and, and pull it out a lot easier. It's a lot easier than getting in with like shovels and spades and picks and trying to hog it out. Because what happens when you do that is you're eventually or inevitably going to be putting soil on top of the invasive species you're trying to get out. So if you haven't seen a sod cutter, they're very easy to handle, uh, provided your site is flat and you don't, if, you know, if you're going to do something like this, you have to do the 1-800, you have to call before you dig, right? You're not, you don't want to be doing anything like this without having a mark out. Um, so just for that clarification, uh, but you can rent, you can rent uh, sod cutters at Home Depot. They're, they're easy to use, um, but that's to, that's the most efficient and effective way that we found to, of getting rid of those ground covers. So here's a double question there. You might see it like sort of a, sort of like a leading question. So you may have to unbundle it. Should the mulch ring match the width of the canopy? No, it should be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> more, more. So my philosophy is, first of all, if you have a large mulch ring and it's just mulch, you need plants. Right. So, to me, again, going back to what I said about trying to reduce the size of lawn areas, <clears throat> that's our goal. So from a standpoint of just mulching from out to, I would say if you're going to just mulch a tree ring out to the, out to the drip line is optimal. I mean, the tree roots extend much further than that. I mean, the common uh, or, or the, the past thought was that the, the tree roots grow just to the tree ring, the drip, the drip ring. Um, that, that has been debunked because if you think about it, if you're a tree and you don't want your tree roots underneath your leaves, your canopy, because you're going to, you're going to lose water, you're going to lose nutrients. Um, so those tree roots spread way out past where, um, where the, where the canopy is. Um, so, yeah. So to answer that question, the bigger, the better. If you have it bigger, less mulch, more plants. If you have to just have a mulch ring, then I would say if you can do it at least to the drop, the drip line, then, then that, then that would be fantastic. And so what benefits, I mean, I know the benefits of plants, obviously, but specifically why plant plants under that area? What are the, how does that benefit? Does it draw more of the uh, pollinators that we're looking for? 
It will, yes. It'll also alleviate compaction. Okay. Right? Because a lot a lot of these situations where you have trees in, in the lawn, um, there's a lot of compaction issues because, you know, the, it's the lawn area being run over by a 800 pound or 1200 pound lawnmower four, four times a week or four times a month. Good point. So, so here's a, here's a funny one. How, how to get rid of bamboo, but don't plant it. <laughs> That's a trade secret. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I I think I know that trade secret, right? You yeah, so, shared that with me a couple of years ago. <laughs> yep. So the way we do that is, um, again, you got to call for mark out. Make sure you're not taking these steps I'm going to mention without a mark out. Mm -hmm. um, but you cut the canopy off, any any of the top growth, cut it down and remove it. <clears throat> and that you can chip it. You can you can whatever you want to do with that. That the top portion of bamboo does not sprout. It's just the roots that will. Um. So with the roots, what we do is we use a stump grinder. And the benefit to that is, and, and, and we have 98% success of non-regrowth with using a stump grinder because literally you're just annihilating the root systems and there's nothing left of that root system to regrow. Um, so, you know, you have to monitor it just to be sure that there's no little pieces left that, that may sprout. And if they do, the soil's, you know, if we're planting in these areas anyway, which is typically what we're doing, we're not just going to take bamboo out and, and leave it bare. Obviously, by my discussion, we know if we have bare areas, we're putting native plants in them. So we have to go back and monitor just to make sure there's no resprouting. But and if there is, it's the soil is pretty loose. So we just go in and dig it out. Um, but a stump grinder is is the best way to to remove bamboo. There's no spraying. There's no removing of thousands of yards of topsoil, which what do you do with it? Because it's essentially, you know, biohazard, right? I mean, you can't put it anywhere. What are you going to do with it? It's got to, it's got to go into a landfill because you can't, you can't compost it. You can't put it into the topsoil. You can't screen it because you're going to end up with bamboo in, in your topsoil or compost. So stump grinder. Okay. Here's one that's exactly something you sort of described, which is if your dogwood root system diameter is large and raised above the ground, how do you protect those roots? Do they need to be dug out? They are about 15 years old. Um, hard to say really without seeing, but gen, gen, generally speaking, um, you do need to be a little careful, uh, depending upon where those roots are in, in the buttress system of the, of the, of the collar. Um, because it, you can have some issues sometimes with some sun scald, just like, <clears throat> just like if you, if you're, if you're pruning, let's say a beech tree, right? We, we know beech trees are susceptible to sun scald if the, if the tops are pruned too hard. Um, if they're, or, you know, if they're pruned for ornamental fashion, not, not as a mature species, um, they'll get sun scald. So you have to be careful of some of the roots. But what I would do is I would cover them slowly. If, if you've done a root collar excavation and you've excavated those roots and it's nice and clear, what I would do is I would cover them back up a little bit, not the flare, but the exposed roots that are away from the, from the flare, cover them a little bit with a little bit of mulch and just sort of slowly continue to take that mulch off and expose it to some sunlight so that they don't, so that they don't get any scold on them. But really the roots, the most important thing are the roots that are um, the, the buttress roots right against the flare. That's the most important part to keep clear. If any of the roots that are out away from, out away from that buttress system, they're, they're not, they're okay to be covered um, because those are the ones that, for all intents and purposes are not secondary roots they want to be below the surface okay so they're, they're probably okay to be covered so the most important thing is the buttress root system what directly adjacent to the buttress root system not keeping that covered and there was a question about letting grass grow right up to the tree but i think you already answered that as because of mowing issues it presents yeah, compaction not. issues but yeah. but the parallel question to that is what plants have you found grow successfully in the mulch ring well, um, anything that is a native understory, right? For the most part, um, carax, carax grasses, sedges, I should say. Um, um, there's asters, um, uh, asters, and they changed the botanical name to, um, uh, I can't remember now. My suggestion is because I'm, my, my blonde moments have turned to gray moments is, um, Go to the website, the, the nwf.org website um, and, and or Jersey Friendly Yards. And what you can do there is you can put in your site specific, um, what you need for your site and, and they'll help you uh, find the right plants for that spot. But there's a lot of 
like I said in my in my presentation, there's a native plant for every spot. You just need to figure out what it is. And if you if you were to go and just Google, you know, do a Google search for um, native understory perennials or sedges, you would probably come up with a, a substantial list of of places where you can you can find um, find a list of plants that would suit you. There's a lot. Yeah. There's a lot. So here's one, a question on native fruiting trees. Are there any that produce fruit for human consumption? You yes. have to read the rest of that question because Robert once said, I was considering pears once, but wasn't sure if they are native. Pear, mm. right? Right. Rick and I, the one field, right? Fish and wildlife uh, field oh, that yeah. we have every day, right? All the they cows it. pears. They cut it, but they left, they left the big pairs up. Yeah, notice that. So hopefully they go back and cut them down, but I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, so native fruit trees. Um, there, again, the easiest thing to do would be to um, just do a Google search. There's pawpaws, um, mm. amelanchier. Um, there's, there's quite a few. I have a terrible time doing this on the spot. Um I'll tell you what, if anybody, if anybody can't find anything and they want to just reach out to me and shoot me an email, um, I'd be happy to point them in the direction of, of anything if I can. Mm. But yeah, I mean, there's, there are, there, there, you know, none of them are, are ever going to be for production, uh, but you can, you know, I mean, blueberries for crying out loud, they're, they're a native, not a tree, but native shrub. And, yeah, and actually, very, Susan very... just posted that in the chat. Blueberries, somebody yeah. else said pers persimmon. Persimmon. Persimmon, persimmon. persimmon. persimmon yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, Sue wants to know if persimmon is native to New Jersey. Native to New Jersey. I believe it is. Yeah. Again, Jersey friendly yards, right? Yeah. That's an easy one. That's an another easy good. One. Yeah. And Susan uh, Landau actually put a um, a website too. I don't know if you've heard of this one, Rick Pollinators, nativeplants.com. Mm -hmm. i have to look that one up. Pollinate, uh, it's in the chat. Yeah. You could use uh, Bone App is another one. Um, that that there, there's a, there's a lot of different spots, but th those are the ones that are I think the easiest for folks to use or the the ones I the ones I mentioned. Very good, Rich. Do you see anything else in the chat? I know we're we're um... yep. There is one species of persimmon. I just quickly looked it up. That is native to New Jersey. The common persimmon. It is referred to as. Um, they're so they're so they're so tricky though because. The thing about persimmon is you have to get them like as they hit the ground, <laughs> <laughs> because if you, if you don't get them in there, they, they have, um, they're very, um, astringent. And if you were to eat one, that's, that's not, that's not ripe. It's it dr really, they'll dry your mouth out. And, and the, the, the appropriate time to get them is when they've just, just about hit the ground. So they're, they're, they're a tough one. You know, I mean, unless you're out there standing, looking up, waiting for them to fall, because they're going to be 40, 60 feet up, you know, they're not, they're not going to be close to the ground. They're going to be up in the canopy. So Lori, these last few questions, anything here that you're good with? Uh, I like the, the uh, question. Uh, do you have a plan or plant recommendation for a wet, muddy, full sun area that previously was infested with watercress? It's pretty wet. Yeah, it's pretty wet. Interesting that it's that wet and still full sun. Mm -hmm. so um that that could be an email to rick for further swamp, swamp white oak would be great there. yeah if you have the space okay nissa nissa sylvatica again that would be um space if it's uh, on that one uh, uh a black oak black oak black oak okay Black gum. Lori, is there any that we missed? Uh, I think we're good. I know somebody's saying, how do you spell those? <laughs> but um, common names, right? Swamp white oak. Swamp white oak and uh, black gum. Black gum. So you can look those up for sure. So when Jerry Lynn had uh, re-commented, we didn't uh, touch on it. Uh, Jerry Lynn's the one that... Um, had the the tree in the pot and wanted to know how to you know whether re, replant or whatever she doesn't have a good site to plant it 
So, cause it needs a lot of space. So um, I think she needs to give that tree to somebody, <laughs> right? To yeah. make a wonderful gift <laughs> so it can get in the ground, right? Well, Lori, was yeah. that answer the, the same as for the other question, which what trees might work in a wet forest area? That recently yeah, I see just Star Charlize, by the yes. way. Hi, Charlize. Yeah. Good to Hi. have you here. <laughs> right. Um, wants to know what trees might work in a wet forest area and recently just had all the ash downed under red maples. Nope. Kind of the same question, but a little different. So um, are you okay if we send them to you for a follow-up email? Okay. And again, it's um, I know we ended the slideshow. It's uh you want to use uh Richard at agza.net. Yes, that's fine. Okay. So Richard at Agza, A G Z A dot net. There you go. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good. Right. Great conversation. I'm I'm Excellent. sad that we're Richard, not thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lori. Thanks, everybody. I yep. appreciate you uh spending some time here. And um, like again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hope Thank to you. see you next month. All right. Bye, guys. All Bye. right. Take care.